Good evening. I'm Wolfgang Aulitsky, the director of the Open Medical Institute. It is my great pleasure to moderate this year's Music for Medicine benefit again, but this time out of Salzburg. It is now one o'clock in the morning and I'm talking to you from the faculty lounge at Schloss Amberg, where we usually celebrate the graduation of each seminar with a glass of champagne with the whole faculty. This COVID year is a year like no other. This is also true for this year's benefit, which was turned into a virtual transatlantic co-production, bringing together music and medicine at the highest level. It is now my pleasure to introduce our chairman, Tom McGrath. Good evening. I am Tom McGrath, Chairman of the American Austrian Foundation, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this year's Music for Medicine. I think I speak for all of us when I say that this year has been very challenging. So we are grateful that you are with us tonight. Organizing a virtual event in a short period of time is quite a feat. And I would like to thank our team and benefit chairs, Dr. Tony Gatto and Daisy Soros, for their efforts in bringing you this excellent program and, of course, the faculty from our academic institutions. Please stay safe and be healthy. Daisy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tom. I'm delighted that despite Corona, we are able to continue our music for medicine tradition. Since 1997, the best musicians of the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra have performed for us. They and our best physicians joined forces to improve healthcare for millions around the world. Usually, we welcome you to Carnegie Hall for our concert. However, this year, we have a double header for you with music from Vienna with members of the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra and Jeffrey Bronfman joining us from New York. And now let me welcome the president of the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, Daniel Froschauer, who will introduce you to the musicians. The Vienna Philharmonic is very happy to support the American Austrian Foundation. Um, this year, we have to do it by video and we have two of our top musicians, Rainer Honeck, our concertmaster, and Anneline Lenartz. I find it particularly charming that they chose to play the fantasy by Saisons because our orchestra collaborated with Saisons on several occasions. I may point out that uh, Saisons came to Vienna to play here at the Musikverein with our orchestra, Beethoven Third Piano Concerto, uh, under the conductor Hans Richter, and he also conducted his own music. And in 1906, he came to Salzburg to play Mozart's E-flat Piano Concerto with our orchestra. So there was a collaboration on several occasions, so I'm happy they chose that piece. When I, in uh, 2017, went to New York to attend the fundraising for the American Austrian Foundation, I was very touched by a film I saw about the activities of the foundation in which I saw that doctors from abroad come to Salzburg and study to perform operations and then bring it back to their respective countries. And this idea was very touching in many ways. Um, so I'm happy that we can support these activities again. I hope next year again in person, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Well, harp and violin is a wonderful combination, but sadly not many composers wrote originally for this um, duo. But we're very happy to present you an original piece um, by Camille Sesson, and it's the fantasy. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> Thank you.
What a wonderful concert. Thank you for this great performance. It was the 24th time that the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra played for us, but it was the first time that they could not come to New York and that we could not have dinner afterwards. And I must tell you, we really missed that opportunity. And we really hope that we will be together in New York next year at the benefit Music for Medicine. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Augustine Choi, the Dean of Weill Cornell Medicine. It was in 1993 when physicians of Weill Cornell and the American Austrian Foundation decided to start the Open Medical Institute. Thank you, Daniel. 
And thank you, Rainer and Anlin, for this wonderful concert, which allowed our minds to wonder and forget about COVID-19. While Cornell Medicine and OMI worked so hard to help patients and physicians during these very challenging times. As the holiday season is upon us, I know we are all eagerly awaiting a vaccine so that we can reunite with family and friends very soon. It is therefore an honor to welcome Dr. Anthony Fauci, graduate of Wild Cornell Medicine and director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases of the National Institutes of Health, who will speak to us about COVID-19. On behalf of the entire community, we thank Dr. Fauci for his leadership and his will to fight off this coronavirus. Thank you. Greetings. My name is Tony Fauci, and it is my great pleasure to speak about COVID-19 at the Open Medical Institute special program. I also thank you for all your good work, especially during these difficult times. As you can see from this first slide, I'm going to be addressing with you today the public health and scientific challenges of COVID-19. This is a slide of the cover of JAMA from January of this year, in which my colleagues and I wrote a viewpoint. This was very soon after the recognition of this new pandemic coronavirus. And I chose the title coronavirus infections more than just a common cold. Not at all to be facetious, but to point out to the readers of the viewpoint that we have had experience with coronaviruses for decades and decades. In fact, as shown by this phylogenetic tree of the coronaviruses, there are a number of human coronaviruses that are designated in red letters, as you can see in the beta coronavirus section, very closely related to animal coronavirus, particularly bats. The four coronaviruses that are highlighted in yellow are the four coronaviruses that account for about 15 to 30 percent of all of the common colds that so many of us experience it repetitively each year usually during the winter months. Then in 2002 and in 2012, we had our experience with the first pandemic coronaviruses. Many of you recall the severe acute respiratory syndrome, which began in Guangdong province of China, jumping from a bat to a civet cat to a human, leading to a pandemic of over 8,000 cases and close to 800 deaths. It was contained completely by public health measures, likely because although it spread well in iatrogenic settings, it did not spread globally in a very efficient and effective manner. 10 years later in 2012, we had the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS, which again came from a bat to a camel to a human in Saudi Arabia, and it did not have the capability of rapid spread as the original SARS did, and it still is actually smoldering somewhat in the Middle East. But here we are today. Now we are dealing with the third of the pandemic coronaviruses, recognized clinically in the Wuhan district of central China in December, and then identified as a new coronavirus by the Chinese in the first week of January, where they put it on a database that was public, from which much of the work on vaccines has now evolved, which I'll get to in a moment. So now what we have is a SARS coronavirus. And notice the proximity to the original SARS, which essentially uh, triggered a change in the nomenclature. So the original SARS became SARS-CoV-1, and the new coronavirus became SARS-CoV-2. So speaking of nomenclature, what we have is a disease designated as COVID-19 for coronavirus disease 2019 as the disease. And the novel coronavirus, as I mentioned, is now called SARS-CoV-2. So what has this brought to our planet? The most devastating pandemic of a respiratory illness in the last 102 years since the famous or infamous pandemic of 1918. Now, as of the 23rd of November, close to 60 million cases globally, 
and about 1.4 million deaths. We in the United States of America have been hit the hardest of any country in the world with 12 plus million cases and over a quarter of a million deaths with a density of cases per 100,000 population shown on this heat map of the United States with the darker colors in blue indicating a high case, case rate per 100,000 population. Now, if you look at this another way, let's look at where we are right now. Look at the right-hand part of the slide, the lower right. Six months ago, five, four, three, two, one. The red indications indicate the hot places, namely where you have cases per 100,000, dark red being the worst, green being really good. Take a look at the new cases per 100,000 over the last couple of weeks. The country is essentially, if you want to use the metaphor, red hot with an outbreak. And as a matter of fact, if you look at the surges of cases throughout three periods during this nine to 10 month period that we've experienced, look at the slope of the trajectory in early spring when the New York metropolitan area was seriously hit. Then look at the late spring, early summer where you saw the trajectory of the curve. But look at the slope of the curve of where we are right now as we get into the cold months of the soon end of fall and early winter, particularly during the travel season, why there is such concern about the numbers of cases that are breaking all records now. We can get back to that in a bit, but let's now just switch over quickly to the virology. When you look at this virus, as I showed you on a prior slide, it's a beta coronavirus. It's an RNA virus, which you would expect to mutate somewhat, and it does. There are four structural proteins, the S or spike protein being the most important, particularly the receptor binding domain, which binds to the ACE receptor, which is distributed on cells in the upper and lower airway, the GI tract, cardiovascular tissue, and others. Work has been done at the NIH on the precise conformational structure as determined through cryo-EM, which is referred to as the prefusion conformation shown here, which is the basis of virtually all, with one exception, virtually all of the vaccine work that is being done to induce an immune response against this particular component in this particular conformation. What about transmission? This is a respiratory transmitted virus by typical respiratory droplets, which generally are large enough to fall within a few feet, hence the six foot rule of social and physical separation. However, recent data have indicated that there is a degree of, we're not sure exactly how much, but a degree of aerosol spread, which means droplets that are light enough to be able to stay suspended over time and various distances, and how long this lasts and for how long is still up to discovery and hopefully will be delineated as we get more information. The virus is found in the stool, semen, blood, and other secretions. The role of this in transmission is unclear, but likely not of a particularly large significance. The risk of transmission varies due to a number of factors. The type and duration of exposure, prevention measures used, the viral load. Transmissions are common among household contacts. And in healthcare settings, when PPE is not used or not properly used, and certainly in closed settings, such as cruise ships, nursing homes, and prisons. Factors that may increase the risk are crowded and closed spaces with poor ventilation. And most people would think that it's by coughing and sneezing, which is true, but also by singing or speaking loudly or even breathing heavily, which is the rationale for why we have five fundamentals to prevent the acquisition and transmission of this virus. The universal wearing of masks or cloth face coverings, maintaining physical distances of at least six feet, avoiding crowds in congregate settings, doing things outdoors much better and much more preferential than indoors and frequent washing of hands. One of the extraordinary aspects of this infection, that of the millions and millions of individuals that have been infected, about 40 to 45% of these are without symptoms and modeling studies show that these asymptomatic individuals are a major source 
of the community spread, the silent spread that is so difficult to do contact tracing on. Modeling studies, as I mentioned, have shown that as many as 50% of the transmission are actually through transmission from an asymptomatic person to an uninfected individual. What about the clinical manifestations? The early signs and symptoms are very reminiscent of what we commonly call a flu-like syndrome, with the manifestations and the percentages shown on this slide. However, a substantial proportion of people also have the curious experience of a loss of smell or taste, which usually precedes the onset of respiratory symptoms. Of those who do have symptoms, about 80% the symptoms are mild to moderate, not requiring any particular medical intervention, certainly not hospitalizations. Where about 15 to 20% of individuals have severe and critical symptoms and signs, and in fact, often require substantial intervention, such as hospitalization, critical care, intubation, and mechanical ventilation. Case fatality among those with severe is variable, but can be anywhere from 2.3% up to as high as 20 to 25% in people requiring mechanical ventilation, particularly for prolonged periods of time. Now, who are at risk for these severe illnesses associated with this infection? First, we have older adults. This is a slide with striking data showing you the extraordinary difference in the parameter of the rate per 100,000 population of hospitalization by age with very, very few, as you see on the left-hand part of the slide, among the young, which then goes up to a very large amount, as you see in those individuals from 75 years of age and older. In addition, people of any age with certain underlying medical conditions are at risk for severe COVID-19 illness. It's broken up into two major categories by the CDC the medical conditions that are associated with an increased risk for severe disease. Namely, there's no doubt about it. That is obesity, which looms large in this. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, diabetes, pregnancy, heart conditions. And then there are those conditions that may confer an increased risk. That information is not as tight as with the others. And for these, it's the immunocompromised state cardiovascular disease, diabetes, overweight, but not quite yet um, true obesity, as well as a number of other conditions. The manifestations of once you get a severe manifestation, acute respiratory distress syndrome dominates that picture, but we also see cardiac dysfunction that might lead to arrhythmias, cardiomyopathies, and sudden death. There's neurological kidney and other disorders. And there's an interesting hypercoagulable state with microthrombi in small vessels and thromboembolic phenomenon that can account for strokes in what would seem to be an otherwise normal individual. And then there's the curious multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, which is very reminiscent of the disease we call Kawasaki syndrome. Once people recover virologically, namely there's no longer virus in their system and they're not transmissible, a certain percentage, and we're working on what percentage that is, anywhere from 25% or more of individuals, be they at home, sick for days to weeks, or in the hospital, or having extensive prolonged hospitalization requiring medical interventions. These individuals, again, a percentage that we're working on, but likely around 25%, have the persistence measured in weeks to months of symptoms that are quite common among them and consistent. Extensive extended fatigue, shortness of breath, whereby athletic people find very, very difficult getting up a flight of stairs. Sleep disturbances, dysautonomia, temperature control problems as well as what has been referred to as brain fog or a difficulty in concentrating 
or focusing on something mentally. Therapeutics, we have developed over now the last nine to 10 months, therapeutics for a variety of the stages of disease. The NIH has put together an expert treatment guidelines panel, which produces a living document that's frequently updated as new clinical data recruit. And access to this can be through COVID-19 treatmentguidelines.nih.gov, or if you forget that, just go to nih.gov and go through the search to find this. There are selected therapeutics for three different components of the disease, early to moderate disease, moderate to advanced disease, as well as adjunct therapies. Several of these are under emergency use authorization, and many of these are in clinical trials. Let's take a look at some of them. There was an emergency use authorization for convalescent plasma in individuals who we would hope get to them as they have early disease. There was a remdesivir trial for individuals hospitalized requiring pulmonary assistance, usually individuals who have requirement for low flow oxygen. These individuals were shown in a randomized trial to have a diminution in the time to recovery. An emergency use authorization has been just uh, issued for the anti-inflammatory baricitamide in combination with remdesivir compared to remdesivir alone as a result, again, of a randomized trial. Recently, the FDA has authorized the use of a monoclonal antibody from the Lilly company, in this case, Bamlanivimid, which is good for treating mild to moderate illness in people who have an age of greater than 12, but in all patients. In addition, most recently, just literally a few days ago, the FDA has authorized, again, by an emergency use authorization, two monoclonal antibodies from the company Regeneron. The general feeling is that these types of interventions, antibodies, convalescent plasma, if we get to immune serum, uh, hyperimmune globulin, as it were, should be used early in the course of disease. In contrast, dexamethasone, a commonly used steroid, has been shown in a randomized placebo-controlled trial in individuals either requiring ventilation or high-flow oxygen. It, it significantly diminished 28-day mortality. Better used late in the course of the disease, and in fact, if used earlier, it was shown not only to not have an effect, but perhaps to make things even worse, which goes along with our understanding of the pathogenic mechanisms of this disease where it's best to attack the virus early, but individuals who progress later in the course of disease have more of a dangerous inflammatory aberrant immunological and inflammatory response, which needs to be suppressed with anti-inflammatories or glucocorticoids in this case. So early on, attack the virus, later on, attack an aberrant inflammatory or immune response. And then finally, there's vaccines. We in the United States have taken a strategic approach to COVID-19 vaccine research and development, which was articulated in a, an opinion piece in Science last May, which my colleagues and I described what we call a coordinated approach in which you have harmonized protocols, where you have multiple vaccine platforms using the same common data and safety monitoring board, common primary and secondary endpoints, and common immunological parameters that can serve as correlates in order to be used as bridging studies. These are three of the platforms that are being used and the developers shown in the middle of the slide. Again, the federal government is involved in the development of or facilitation of the testing of six candidates. Two fall within the nucleic acid platform of messenger RNA, Moderna company, as well as Pfizer and BioNTech. We'll get back to that in a moment. Also, studies on viral vectors, the chimp adno with the University of Oxford and AstraZeneca, as well as the ad26 human adno as a prime. 
This is a single dose one that is being used by Janssen, a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson. And then finally, protein subunits, the classical way we've used for years by Novavax and Sanofi together with an adjuvant. As you can see on the right-hand part of the slide, five of these candidates are in phase three trial. Two have been completely enrolled with data already in. Before we get to that, I wanna talk about the speed with which we've gone from a understanding the sequence in January 10th to beginning the GMP production in collaboration with Moderna from the Vaccine Research Center, a little bit more than two months later, a phase one trial, then into a phase two a couple of months later, and then getting into a phase three. And now in November, we have a vaccine less than a year later, which is showing about a 95% efficacy. And in fact, if you look at the trials that are being done, Pfizer, who did this somewhat independently, came out with data showing a very impressive 95% efficacy. Moderna had close to that, a 94.5, essentially a 95% efficacy. Both Moderna and Pfizer were also very powerful in preventing severe disease, as well as the primary endpoint, which was clinically recognizable disease. Now, AstraZeneca, most recently, literally days ago, was shown in a study that was actually done in the UK and in Brazil, with some small amount being done in South Africa, showing in two different dosing regimens that one of the dosing regimen had about a 90% efficacy. Now, with already three vaccines which are showing powerful efficacy. What about vaccine distribution? These plans await recommendations from the CDC after they consult with the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices and the National Academy of Medicine. So when the EUAs are granted, the CDC will come out with recommendations of who should be prioritized as we go from modest amount to uh, of vaccine doses available to large amounts. This is a preliminary view of that. This may not be the final, and I wanna make you aware of that, that this is what the National Academy came out with. But again, the final decision is with the CDC in collaboration with the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Healthcare workers and first responders people with high risk comorbidities and those living in congregate settings like nursing homes, and then teachers, school staff, critical workers, moderate risk comorbidities, people in jails and prisons, homeless shelters, and then as you get further down, people who are relatively healthy and members of society with not critical roles. One of the things we need to be attentive to is to get as many people vaccinated as we possibly can if we want to get a veil or an umbrella of herd immunity. But this is a sobering slide because it says here in the United States, if you look at people who plan or plan not to get a vaccine, the numbers are sobering. If you look at the bottom, particularly the vulnerable population that I mentioned a moment ago, African-Americans and Hispanics, Look at the African-Americans, 40% don't want the vaccine, 32% are not sure, Hispanics a little better, 23 and 37. So we really have a responsibility of reaching out at the community level to be transparent and let people know of the independent nature of the process that went into deciding whether or not a vaccine was safe and effective. And I wanna end again with this slide that I believe is very important. And that is we've been hit with now three pandemic coronaviruses, one of which is now ongoing and raging and historic in nature. Clearly, it is time for us to develop a universal corona vaccine. We've shown very quickly and expeditiously that you can make a highly efficacious vaccine against this coronavirus. So I feel strongly it will put a lot of effort into the goal that I believe we can achieve 
of developing a universal coronavirus that would protect us not only against the common colds that we get affronted with literally every year, but also the ongoing danger of yet again another coronavirus pandemic. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to make this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Fauci, for sharing your insights and for your leadership. We're all aware of the tremendous demands on your time as guardian of the nation, and thank you for your willingness to carve out a moment to be with us tonight. The selfless dedication of the Well Cornell and Open Medical Institute faculty to sharing knowledge and expertise in order to improve the quality of healthcare in countries in transition is exemplary. Dr. Fauci, you are the true embodiment of this kind and generous spirit which inspires us to give the best of ourselves. I am proud to have established Alianza Medica para la Salud, a Mexican foundation a decade ago in order to partner with OMI. The need to train Mexican physicians and improve healthcare in Mexico has never been greater. My wife Almudena and I are committed to continuing our support for this exceptional endeavor and we're pleased to announce a gift of $250,000 to endow the Salzburg Well Cornell Seminar in Pulmonology, which is being led by Dr. Agustin Choi. We know how important it is to provide better healthcare to people all over the world, and long related complications are widespread with COVID 19, as well as past threats such as MERS and SARS. I hope our gift inspires others to support seminars dealing with other infectious diseases. My esteemed board colleagues, Dr. Tony Gatto and Daisy Soros, have already made such gifts. With an annual roster of 40 OMI seminars, this leaves 37 more to endow. Our annual gala has always been about music in support of medicine. True to this tradition, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce another outstanding musician and good friend of the American Austrian Foundation, Maestro Jeffin Brofman. Jeffin has played at many AAF benefits and is a frequent guest at Slosh Adenberg when he performs at the Salzburg Easter and Summer Festivals. Jeffim, welcome back and thank you for lifting our spirits with your virtuosity. Dear friends, it's a great honor to play for the Gala of Austrian American Foundation. I want to thank personally Catherine and Wolfgang Olitsky for their friendship and warmth. And thanks to them and the foundation, Schloss Arenberg has become my home in Salzburg for many years. It's where I have encountered some of the greatest scientific minds. And what is so touching about the foundation is their interest in music, arts, and humanity. And that is what makes them go a step farther in their embrace of all cultures, regardless of their religious beliefs and politics. And they stand out as an exemplary organization to contribute to our society. I hope to be playing for you in person very soon. Thank you.
Dear Jeffen, thank you for this wonderful piece of music. We hope to see you again soon in Salzburg. After all this beautiful music and also this very interesting and comprehensive summary of COVID-19 by Dr. Fauci, I would like to tell you now briefly how the Open Medical Institute coped with COVID-19 this year. We started with lots of energy into 2020. We had five to 10 times more qualified applicants that we could take for each seminar. But after seven seminars, we were hit by the first lockdown. More than 700 travel arrangements from faculty and fellows had to be canceled. But in order to bridge the gap and also continue our mission, we decided to design all virtual seminars, which we called OMINARS. These highly interactive webinars were very well received and helped us to not only continue our mission, but also offer something to our fellows from all over the world. And then, against all odds, the Salzburg Music Festivals took place. We decided to copy their successful COVID prevention concept and started to organize hybrid seminars in the fall. We were able to hold six hybrid seminars with 200 participants in a row. Let me briefly explain to you what means hybrid seminars. Well, the fellows and the faculty from Europe were present on site, but the US faculty which due to travel restrictions could not travel and could not come to Salzburg, they were live streamed into the lecture hall. But then the second COVID wave hit Europe and we had to switch back to the OMINAR format. Overall, despite the pandemic, we could administer 24 out of 40 training courses and we were able to educate more than 600 fellows from all over the world. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown that the virus does not respect boundaries and how important it is that well-trained healthcare professionals worldwide take the right decisions at the right moment. This is exactly the mission of the Open Medical Institute. We train physicians in countries of transition in order to build local healthcare capacity and create a global network of qualified physicians who are willing to collaborate. Since 1993, as I've told you before, we have trained more than 24,000 doctors from more than 120 different countries and we mentor them throughout their careers. Every year we are adding an additional 1,500 physicians to the network, which was expanded through AMSA into Latin America. This is only possible because we have such a dedicated faculty and I would like to take this opportunity and thank the physicians of Weill Cornell Medicine, including Hospital for Special Surgery and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, our colleagues from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Columbia University, Duke University, the Cleveland Clinics, Maastricht University, the Institut Pasteur in Paris, and the Medical University in Vienna, Innsbruck, and Graz. We therefore ask you to support our work and consider a donation, because it's your donation that makes it possible that we successfully continue our work. This year's donation will be dedicated to those areas of medicine which were crucial for the treatment of severely sick COVID-19 patients. We will use the funds to support fellowships for the seminars in pulmonology, anesthesiology and intensive care units, and infectious diseases. 
Besides all the pain caused by COVID-19, we are now seeing light at the end of the tunnel, thanks to the successful development of effective vaccines. We thank you for all your goodwill and your donations. It was a pleasure to spend this hour with you. I really hope that you enjoyed the music. I really hope that you appreciated this excellent talk given by Dr. Fauci. And now I wish you happy holidays. Thank you very much for being with us.